Okay, so uh, once again, my name is Jason Myers, and I'm here to share a little bit about uh, pandas with you today. Uh, pandas is huge in the scientific community, so I'm sure all the scientists, uh, when they see me get up and talk about pandas, they feel like I'm that panda sitting on top of my head. Um, I use pandas in a really weird uh, way at work, and uh, I'm going to share that with you as my real-world problem example, but I want to first kind of start by talking uh, about what's so special about pandas. So there's really kind of four things that make pandas a really unique uh, library and a really unique way to manipulate and handle data. So uh, if you've never played with pandas before, it basically gives you a tabular or a matrix way to store data. Uh, and to deal with data. So if you want to turn that into like uh, another analogy, think of it as like Excel or if you've used like SPSS from IBM or even uh, one way to look at it is like a SQL table. So it's a very tabular or matrix oriented uh, data types. It's very smart uh, about dealing with messed up data. Right? So if you have data that doesn't look the same all the way or uh, would be difficult to just stick into a, a dictionary, this is a great way to uh, deal with data that has pieces missing or that just don't make sense in the rest of the thing. So it can deal with data that's ordered, unordered, mixed types of data that you wouldn't normally be able to, uh, to handle very well. And uh, it's really nice because the manipulation of that data is super simple. So it's easy to um, add and remove elements. It's easy to slice, merge, pivot those things together. Uh, one of the really beautiful things about Panda is it's built on top of NumPy. So all of the features of NumPy uh, that you used to have an access to through that library, it provides a nice, very simple interface to those and a very clean way to deal with it. And then it's amazing for dealing with time sequences. So because so much science is all about this happened when and this occurred when, uh, if you have any data that can really should be indexed by Tom, Pandas is an amazing way uh, to play with that. It supports things like uh, date windowing, time ranges, and the slice notation that we're very familiar with for lists and that kind of stuff are supported for time, which is kind of, an, kind of amazing. Uh, and then the last thing, like I mentioned, was time series. So we can do roll-ups, shifting, we can do lagging indicators, uh, those kind of things. So it's more like this kind of panda than the panda I showed you the first time. Um, <laughs> I was a WoW addict, I'm recovering, but I still use the GIFs. All right, so let's talk about getting started with Pandas. It's super simple to install. Uh, it's just a pip install. One of the things you'll see a lot in the documentation is uh, they'll often import Pandas as PD. So if you happen to go look at any scientific studies or anything that are done using Pandas, often you'll see PD everywhere. What they're doing is just importing Pandas under that name. So it's not a... Uh, not a throw off. So Pandas really has two uh, powerful elements that we start with. The first of those is the series, uh, which is kind of like an ordered dictionary. And we're going to play through both of these a little bit before we talk about our, our real world scenario so we can kind of see what they're like. So uh, the series is a, a single vector of data. So in NumPy, we'd call this a NumPy array uh, with an index that labels each element within the vector. And I know that's really complicated, but I'll show it to you in a second using cookies and you'll get it. Uh, and then the data frame is that tabular data structure I was talking about. It's comprised of uh, multiple series that are encapsulated like columns in a spreadsheet that don't care about time um, and don't care about the validity of the data. So essentially it's just magic. Dark magic and yeah. So let's talk about that series in a little more detail. So here I'm importing pandas as PD just to, so you get used to seeing it. And I love cookies. In fact, if you go look at any of my profiles, I have the Cookie Monster sticker on my laptop. I'm diabetic for a reason. Uh, so here I'm importing my favorite cookies. They are in order by importance. All right, let's clear that up right now. Um, so chocolate chip, the universal winner of cookies. If you disagree with me, I'm the one talking good luck. Um, so I'm importing these as a list, and it's going to create me a series out of that. And that series is going to look like this. Okay, so I have that ordered list. Here's the order. And this little column over here is actually the index of this series. Remember I mentioned earlier it's an index of a vector. So my vector is cookies, the most important vector that exists on the planet. And then I have this kind of useless index uh, over here. But what this allows me to do is refer to specific pieces within that vector. Okay, I can do it by uh, the name or by this. And notice this data type is an object. So a series is, is obviously an object. Uh, it's a standard Python uh, type that we can use in multiple places. Uh, and I'll dig a little bit further into how to change this around a little bit. So one of the things that I really want to do is look at the values. So obviously values is an array um, that I can get all the vectors. Notice this array still has this object type in it. What's really interesting is, is that a series is actually a container of a series. So it's like turtles all the way down by the time you get to the bottom. 
But the index, which is also part of that series, uh, comes out as this int64 index, which is really just a long integer, if you will. Uh, in the NumPy world, those are called int64s. Uh, so that's what we're seeing here. So I can easily get all the values out of my series by just calling series.values or whatever the index is by calling series.index. So let's actually give it an index. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to create a list of cookies. Again, the only thing we really need to talk about today is cookies. Uh, this is how many I have of each type. Uh, and then the index is the type of cookie. So what I'm going to end up with is a vector of counts down one side, right? And then my index of that vector will be what type of cookie it is. So here we are with an index series. So this is the same thing I created before, except for now the cookie type is my index and these are the counts. Anybody think that's weird? Why is that weird? So the index that's specified here is now a string, right? But the value of that index or the vector is now an integer. So that's why that changed. So this data type right here is referring to the actual values of the vector and not the index. So if that flips to Tom or something in a second, uh, we'll see that, that D top change. What's really nifty about that is that's checkable, right? So you can say, give me a list of all the data that aren't all the data elements that aren't of this type and get just those. Right? So I could come in here and say uh, map for element in this uh, is instance int64, and then it would list all the ones that are or aren't int64. So if one of these turned out to be like purple because I can't type, uh, it would tell me, hey, that one's not an integer. So now that I have them, I can name them. So I want to know like what is each one. So I want to name this the count, and that's what the first thing does. Uh, and you can see now it's name count data top integer, and then I want to index them uh, by type. So I've named essentially the cookies to now be type. So now I can reference those by those names. So I can say, you know, series.type and then open brace chocolate chip, and it will give me the value for the chocolate chip index. Does that make sense? Just nod your head yes. Hopefully enough of you do it, it will make a sound. All right. <laughs> Accessing elements. So here's exactly what I was just talking about. So what I want here is a list of all the cookies. Now here's one of the syntactic uh, sugar pieces that's in pandas. And you'll see this used a lot. So I really care about uh, the cookies that end with sugar in this case. I'm thinking about giving them away because chocolate chip wins and sugar cookies and we can do without those. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying for each cookie or each name that's in the index of the cookies uh, series, give me all the ones that end with sugar. So that returns me back the sugar cookie, the powdered sugar, which who eats those things, uh, and then the counts for those two. So you can see I can get kind of nifty about slicing those series up. There's a handful of these ends with, begins with, contains, is in the middle of, which is a very interesting one, um, that provide me syntactic sugar to very quickly go get just a piece of the data that I want. So scientists use this a lot because the species and phylums of bacteria, for example, are really easy to pull out this way, right? So if you have uh, data that you want to get to often, uh, this is a really nifty way to get like it ends or exists in this family. And then I can say I want, uh, here's another example of uh, kind of pulling back the data in a different way. I want all the ones where I have more than 10 cookies. And so you can get that back. Regardless of their position in the, uh, in the series, I'll still get them back. And the great thing is I'll get them back in order, right? And that order is always determined by the index. And if the index is a string, then I can decide whether that is ordered based on the order in which they're input or ordered based alphabetically. And I can do that with the sorted uh, module. So that's dealing with uh, series and accessing elements. So let's kind of look at the next piece. So this is data frames. Again, I'm all about the cookies. I own them all, except for Marvin. He gets to have an oatmeal cookie. Um, so here I'm creating a data frame. So a data frame is a collection of series. Okay, so here, I'm going to basically create a series called count that's going to have these integer values. I'm going to create a series called type that's going to have those types of cookies. And then I'm going to create a series of owner that decides who owns everything, which basically means I have all the cookies except for Marvin gets one. Um, this is going to give me a structure that looks like this, right? So much like we saw the first time, there's an index that applies to everything and then separate series for each one of those elements, right? I can do all the series magic that I did a second ago with that ends with and that kind of stuff across an entire data frame. And it will search 
any or all or one of the columns that I tell it to to go find that ends with or begins with or greater than kind of thing. So to access the columns, here I've just asked it to give me the type column. I'm referring to it using kind of dictionary syntax here, but you can also do dot type uh, if you prefer that. The reason why I tend to use dictionary syntax is it universally works between series and data frames and in the array structures that come out of them. Uh, if you do the dot notation, you'll have to remember, okay, when I'm dealing with series, I can't do dot, but when I do, when I do a data frame, I can. It's better to use the dictionary uh, kind of ref reference. Then to access rows, this is, I've actually told it to just give me location number two. So that location references my index that was over here, right? So here, this has a count of eight cookies. It's owned by me, of course, and they're gender molasses cookies. Uh, this name that we saw before, in the series that I had defined the types of cookies I wanted in there, this name is always whatever the index was, right? So here, since I called it location two, the name is going to be two. And the data type is object because we are essentially dealing with a series that we returned back. So let's kind of slice some of these roles. Uh, I want to get rows two through five, right? So that's standard slice notation uh, that you're used to seeing. But one of the other things I can do is say, okay, give me rows three and four, right? which would have given me a table that looked like this, right? Just these two rows. But I want to pivot it. I want to look at this data in a different way. So this dot T means transpose. It's like taking that and just rotating it 90 degrees, right? So here I've said, give me those two records, but I want to see them stacked up and down instead of across as a row. And so it's done that. So it makes it easy, like if you want to compare two things and you need to maybe merge two different types of data that aren't in the same order, aren't in the same structure, as long as they're indexed the same, I can use that dot T to flip them and then I can say data frame plus data frame and it will give me the result of both of those. All right? It's kind of cool. So let's look at grouping. So here I want to group by the owner of the cookies. Oh man, I let Marvin have two. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, here I want to group by the owner of the cookies and I just want to sum some numeric value. I didn't tell it what value to sum. It just said, hey, there's one numeric value in his data frame. I'm going to sum it. Does that make sense? That's another one of the kind of syntactic sugars that Panda has is if I had two integers in my data frame, it would sum them both and put them out there beside it. Right? So this is the value. The first line is the corresponding uh, value over here, and then this represents the index of those values. Uh, I kind of trimmed off the bottom of this, but this is essentially, again, returning a series object that contains those things. So I can take this series then and, again, do another number of functions to it if I wanted to. All right, so let's do something weird here. I want to group by the type of cookie that it is, uh, then by the owner, and then I want to sum them by type. So here, just like in before, I grouped by a single thing. I can group by multiples. So it gathers all the types up, it gathers all the, um, all the owners up, and then gives me the count of cookies. So if you've played with Excel at all, you know this is about 90% of what people do with Excel, right? Uh, they want to take some uh, block of data. It's cool, man, we'll get it. Uh, we'll take some block of data and bunch it together into a format like this. So you see a lot of people do pivot tables and those kind of things. This is not actually a pivot table. Uh, Pandas knows how to do that in a different way, and those pivot tables are actually mergeable into Excel, which is like <laughs> crazy thing. All right, so let's look at renaming a column. So that was kind of confusing to have count out there. Really, it was a total. They were just giving me the name of that field and calling it a column. So here, uh, I've created a, a G sum, which is a series sum that's a data, a data group by type and then the sum, and then I just want to say, hey, this column name, it's really total. So nothing crazy to do that. There's no uh, oddness there. It, ex it exists exactly what you expect. So it tells me what uh, operation I was doing and what I named the column, and then gives me the index. All right, so pivot tables. This is kind of magical and crazy. Uh, some really super smart programmer did this, and I'm pretty impressed by it. So pivot table of my data frame. The only values that I want are the counts of cookies that someone has, right? I'm going to index it by the type of cookie, which is what this is. And then the only columns that I care about are owner. So that structured row set of data has now been manipulated, not grouped by, but manipulated into uh, a type pivot uh, that contains the values of count and um, for each column or each owner in this case. Does that make sense? 
So notice how it does not a number there. It's not JavaScript, don't panic. We don't have to like import 50 libraries to make it actually work. This is how Pandas kind of tells you You've got weird data, we're not sure what to do with it. In this case, there just are no values for Marvin for those cookies, right? I'm not sharing any of those with him. Uh, he only gets sugar cookies. So it gives me the not a number, and I have a way to replace that, and I'll show it to you in the real world example, but it understands when data is just not present. Instead of throwing an error because the key doesn't exist, it's going to throw you that not a number. You may also see, also see uh, np.nan for numpy not a number. Uh, the same thing. Does this pivot table example kind of make sense? Follow, shake heads so I can hear rattling. Awesome. Okay, so let's look at joining two pivot tables. So what I was missing in that first one was a total column, right? I didn't have a vision of how many columns I had. So I have another way to fix that. So what I've done here is I've created a pivot table like I had before, um, and that pivot table just has the type and a sum function that was called on it, right? So remember how I did that sum across the series earlier? That's exactly what I've done here to create this pivot underscore T. And I had that gsum table, right? That was like me and Marvin broken out in individual columns. This join works just like SQL join. So you have the option to do left join, right join, and then just join, which says guess, which is what I do because I suck at SQL. Um, <laughs> So that's what I've done here. I've created a data frame, and then I didn't want to see those not a numbers because, yeah, scared of JavaScript. So here it said fill in A, which is replace all the not a numbers with zero and do it in place so I don't have to create another copy of this data frame. Uh, and that gives me this result. So here I've created two data tables, right, or two pivots of data, and then just merged them together. And it, because the indexes were the same, it knew how to put them together automatically. Pretty cool, huh? One of the really slick things about this, remember that dot .t I showed you earlier? What if the data didn't line up correctly, right? What if the index was actually the values and the values were the index by accident? Maybe I got them out of a dictionary that way, or I queried SQL Alchemy and that's how it gave it back to me. Uh, that dot .t would do that same thing. It would convert them so the keys are in the right order and then I can just easily merge them together. So often in code you'll see some query result from SQL Alchemy come out of the database, be put through dot .t and then merged into another data frame. And I know what you're thinking. How in the heck <laughs> do we even get there? Like, this is not a normal thing, and you're right, it's not a normal thing. But let's look at a real world problem. I work at Emma in Nashville. We do um, email and social marketing um, for people. And I don't work on our product that actually sends email. I work on the bad people. Uh, so if you were trying to send out spam through our system, I stalk you, and I also work on this thing of what happens when someone hits unsubscribe, right? Uh, when someone goes to Gmail and they hit this is spam, we get this thing called a feedback notification that says this is spam and we should handle it. Um, so this is the problem that I have to solve. So you can imagine all that data comes in in the exact same format because everybody writes emails beautifully, organized, comma separated things <laughs> that are no problem to handle, right? It's, they're just awesomely great like that. So let's look at some really hipster stuff here. Uh, we're going to look at some seriously hipster things here. Uh, I'm going to go more hipster than hipster, so instead of talking about NoSQL, I'm going to share this awesome thing with you. It's called CSV. Probably not heard of it. It's okay. Don't feel weird. Uh, speaking of CSV, you know we've jumped the shark in conferences when CSV has its own conference. Although the main fight this year was someone wanted to do tabs instead of commas. So what I have here is a CSV that represents uh, a time value and then a count by, these are counts, of how many occurrences I had of a different type of handling the response to spam, right? So essentially I get around 100 different formatted messages back uh, from different email vendors. And I want to know how many do I get by each type, if you will. Check this out. This doesn't exist in these rows, does it? That's extra net new data. Imagine this, last month, someone created a new email format. So I had to account for those as well. Pandas doesn't care. If I was trying to do this in Python, I'd have to do like all this get, you know, oh, if it's not there, replace it with none or zero or, yeah, I'd have to do all these weird things with dictionaries to make this work. Pandas just, it really doesn't care. The other thing is, it's still kind of annoying to read from a CSV, right? You gotta like import the CSV module, iterate through all the rows, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is how you import a CSV in Pandas. You just say read CSV, 
it's going to be quoted, it has a header row. Uh, how many times did I import CSV again? All right. So this is going to take this result CSV, give it to me in a data frame, right? Already broken out into the column or storage, already broken out into series by the position in the comma separated list, right? When it runs out of data, or when a new row shows up with extra data, it just expands the data frame and puts not a number for all the places that don't have that row. Pretty cool, huh? If you have a header, it doesn't even care if the rows are in the same order. So if I have a header, if I was to tick that as one, it would read whatever the first line of that file is, and that would become the index of the data frame. Right? Then I could import files that maybe the first file had ABC and the second file had CDEF. It would know, based on the header, that those don't index together, and so it would separate them uh, when it pulls them in into different pieces and then put them into the same data frame based on the index position. So data that's completely dissimilar could still be merged and read via this, via this pattern. All right, so here's what my data looks like when it's ingested. This is one of the first records. Uh, so I get an index, the date, time, object. This looks remarkably weird, like a string, right? This is going to read it as a string, but we can fix that. How many times it was just an abuse path through method and how many times I actually handled something. There's a bunch more data points, but this is just to kind of give you a feel for what's in the data. So the first thing I want to do is I care about how this occurred in time. Right? I want to know when someone unsubscribed or did I unsubscribe them fast enough. Right? When you click the button, I really want you to be out of our mailing system, not in two weeks, like some of those people <laughs> say, like, unsubscribe. Let me send you a message to tell you I'm actually going to try to unsubscribe you sometime in the next 15 days. I don't want to do that. I want to unsubscribe you as quickly as possible. And so I actually kind of grade myself by how fast people get out of our system, which is a scary thing to do. I'm sure our salespeople love that. Um, so here I've indexed the date time piece of that and I said, hey, convert that to date time. No weird string P thing. Like it's going to read it. It knows that my computer is in either uh, US standard time or maybe it's in UK English time. It understands that from your, from your implementation of Python and then tries to infer what the date time is. So now this looks exactly the same as before, but it's actually a date time object that I can manipulate. Uh, and I'm going to set that date time column to the index and then I'm going to delete that from the field because once it's in the index, that's really where I want it. Then that lets me do something really powerful. So I want to see all the records that are in my data frame between uh, 155 and 210 on a particular day. That's slots notation to do that. That would be so painful to actually do in for loops. It's, it's not even funny. Uh, but what about the data missing points? Just like I showed you before, we still have the option to fill in A, and so anytime data is actually missing, like those ones where I had all those extra columns uh, that weren't there, it gives me a way to, to kind of get that away. So just like I showed you sum on a series before, I can do sums across entire data frames, right? So this is a data frame that I've read in, and if you remember the data frame, it was date time index and a bunch of counters for the different abuse types I've handled. Here are the different abuse types that we handle. That's a few hours, by the way, if you're curious as to how many abuse things and how serious we are about it. We get a lot of them. Um, so broken out by the type, uh, irrespective of time, just by calling dot sum. All right, so broken out across the columns or the series, if you will, and then summed up in totals. I can also do sum of sums, which gives me a grand total. Super simple. So all the methods in pandas are built to chain like that, right? So I can call pivot table dot t dot sum dot cumulative sum dot whatever, dot ends with cookie, and that would all happen in the order that I put them in, right? So I can also do means. So give me the average that's processed in any given time slice, right? So this is take everything, sum it, pick the mean out of the middle. Uh, and so you can see this is how many I do in a five second window, for example. And here's me take, yeah. Is converting your uh, nans to zeros mess up your means? I'm sorry, say that again? Does converting your missing values to zeros mess up your means? No. So what I do is before I do the fields, any math that I'm going to do that's going to be an average or a percentile, I won't do the fill in A before them, right? Uh, if you do the fill in A, it still remembers which ones weren't a number, and it'll actually throw a warning at you saying, hey, you changed these to zeros. They didn't used to be a number. Did you mean to do that? And then it'll run the thing. You know it's wrong because it told you it was wrong, right? 
So it, be, it does what you tell it to do because it's a computer, but it's like, hey, you, you're not a scientist. You should not be playing with pandas. So that's, <laughs> that's what it tells me. <laughs> it tells me that every day. Okay, so speaking of that chaining, here's the time slice. And here, I actually want to take the cumulative sum of something out of NumPy, and I want to map it or apply it like a functional map pattern. I want to apply it to every single row. So you can see here, it's actually looking at the time slices, five minute slices in this case, and then summing up, uh, counting up how many of those I handled over time. Super simple, no crazy coding, no rolling up, no weird dictionary thing to handle when it occurred. Just map it across it. Pretty nifty. Well, let's go one step further because you can. My time slices were in five seconds and five minutes that I've shown you so far, right? What if I just want to take that data and I want it in a day? So that's what this does. So I can resample data and say, take this data I gave to you in five minute increments, squish it all into a day, and then I can tell you how I want to do that. So I can do means by day, sums by day, cumulative sums by day, cumulative sum by day that ends with sugar, like whatever I want to do to resample that data into one thing. So how would you do this in a regular code? You'd create a dictionary with a key for each day, with another key within it for each cookie type. Like it would be a painful thing, right? And then you'd have to handle like, oh, this new type showed up. So you'd have to handle all of those things. This resampling thing is an amazing thing. If you have to deal with data that revolves around time, this is a beautiful toy. And then sorting. Uh, again, the sort works just like sorted does inside the main library. So here I'm going to take the data frame, I'm going to sort it, this is my daily one, I'm going to sort it by abuse handled and then do an ascending false which basically says give me a descending list. And So you can see how many I handled in a given day for that particular abuse type. So I can see like was Tuesday a really bad day compared to last Wednesday, right? Couple of this with slicing and I can actually get that kind of view of data. I can say this is what I did today, what did I do seven days ago, right? I can use describe, so I'm not a scientist and sometimes I don't know how to find the weirdness, right? Like I, if you ask me about how to find like outliers, I'm gonna have to graph it or go read how to find outliers again, right? So the describe function takes 90% of what most people do in NumPy uh, and puts it into a single function. So here I've told my data frame, describe yourself. So it's gonna give me the count, the mean, uh, the standard deviation of it, the minimum uh, that I've seen, and then percentiles to cover that, and then the max that I've seen in a given time frame. So even if I don't really know what my data looks like, maybe I'm exploring it for the first time, like I started an demo a month ago, and uh, we didn't have a good feel for what was going on there. We knew it was working right, but we weren't certain. Uh, so this describe kind of gives me a way to say like, hey, this particular count seems really weird compared to this other one. Maybe this top doesn't make sense. Is that itself a data frame? Is that itself a data frame? Yes. Everything that comes out of pandas, unless it explicitly tells you otherwise, is either a series or a data frame. All right, so once I have all this data, you know I have to send it to someone who doesn't play with pandas, so I needed to go back. Oh, wait. <laughs> that was not a good slide preview. Okay, so now I need to get it back out to CSV or into a buffer as a CSV. And again, all that code I used to write time and time again to get a table out or a dictionary out to CSV. It's literally to CSV and call it. I've been showing from and to CSV. There's also to and from JSON, to and from XML. There's probably to and from SOAP and many other ways to abuse yourself there. Uh, and this is how I felt after realizing that's how I could make CSVs. <laughs> I'll have you know that I still feel that way and keyboards are expensive. <laughs> All right, so one last really cool thing and this is called Vincent. Uh, Vincent is basically amazing. Uh, anybody ever seen Vega? or heard of Vega, the JavaScript library? Yeah, I know we're at a Python conference. You guys can like stone me later. Um, so Vega is a way to use the D3 library. So if you're following now, we're now three abstractions away from actual JavaScript. Um, it's a way to use the D3 library to create really nifty graphs uh, to look at data. So to run through that again, uh, Vincent talks to Vega, Vega talks to D3, D3 tortures people and creates JavaScript. Um, <laughs> So we're quite a ways away from it. And because of that, Vincent natively understands pandas. Like it knows give red panda pumpkin amusement for hours, right? And so this is all I'm going to do to turn my daily data frame into a stacked area graph. Three lines. 
No crazy figuring out how to get Morris or Char.js or any of those things to talk, much less reading the D3 documents, which probably makes Sony engineers that built stereo instructions in the 80s jealous of their how complicated it is. But these three lines will create me a chart that looks like this. Yeah, wow is the right word. Um, now, this makes it easy to spot outliers, right? In addition to stacked areas, there's also line charts, there's also pie charts. Um, and I'm not going to show it here, but there's also this thing called a spectral chart. I can't show the spectral chart because it highlights uh, some data that we're currently working on. Uh, but the spectral chart does like the pattern thing, uh, the dot patterns, so that you can find the outliers. If you look at scientific graphs, particularly around uh, biology, you'll see a lot of spectral patterns. It's interesting that email also is able to find outliers via that same spectrum pattern. Right? We also see that in our social. Uh, products as well. So that's Vincent, a super simple way to get charts out of something once you have it as a data frame. And with that, I will gladly take any questions. Yes? I guess that last bit, you, you view them in a browser? You view them in a browser. So uh, that what you saw there was just a screen cap of IPython. So what I do is uh, I'll take my data frame or my data source, pull it into IPython and view it that way. You can also take pandas and have it, uh, I'm sorry, Vincent, and say, I'm going to include you in like a Flask page, right? Like if you want it as a web app that people can go visit. And there's a, that chart where I said it. There's chart dot to HTML, and it will dump you out a variable that you can just pass to Jinja or a Django template or whatever, and it'll work straight up. Yes? So the map pattern that I showed you where I did the cumulative sum on that one column, you can define a list where I defined one column and then define a list of functions and it will pairwise them across that. So if I had a list of uh, any abuse, abuse handled, abuse bounce, and then I defined maybe I want a cumulative sum of any abuse, the mean of abuse handled, and then the abuse bounce I wanted a uh, running uh, average, then I can do that and map them out that way. Yes? Sorry, what's that? Uh, you can get the slides uh, out on my GitHub, which is github.com slash Jason A. Myers. I pretty much go by that everywhere unless you hear me call myself Linux Hermit, uh, which is what I, my goal is to go like live in a hole right there. Um, but you can get the slides there. It's just a reveal JS presentation. I try to get them up on SlideShare, but sometimes they don't translate well to PDFs. Yes? Have you managed to break pandas with too many rows? Uh, no, but I have managed to break servers, which brings up a great point. So the ability to do infinite manipulation and to deal with weird data is also the ability to use as much memory as has been created by mankind. Uh, it's kind of like if you have four teenagers who want to all play Xbox Live at the same time, Comcast is just like, I quit. Right? Uh, your server will do the same thing. So you're creating an in-memory object when you pull up this data frame. Right? So you have to be aware of the structure of the data that you're pulling in and just how much it can grow exponentially, right? So um, I know the question you're going to ask is, how do I tell how big my data frame is? And that's a question everybody's trying to answer. Um, but in general, you can kind of profile the application and, and see the increase from creating the data frame. I can tell you it's nowhere near as bad as you're thinking uh, because the libraries underneath Pandas are all C-based, right? So it's, it's very efficient. You guys can edit that on the video, right? Uh, it's very efficient about how it handles and deallocates and allocates memory, but yes, that is an in-memory object. So that's the most common way that you break pandas. That, and if you want to do something really crazy, so uh, that map function that I applied to a single row, I can put any function in there. So I can write bad code and then say run that bad code hundreds of times. I'm really good at that. Remember pandas comes up and says you're not a scientist, but I'm going to do this anyway? This is one of those moments. Uh, so I will map a bad function, and that's the most common way I break pandas. Uh, it was either running out of memory or writing a bad function to begin with. Yes? Are there any other limitations that you run into in your work? No. Uh, I haven't run into anything. So I, I use it at work on our email problem, but I also have a, a thing on the side called Sucretrans, which is a management tool for diabetics, and we use it for tracking and trending there. I have about two years' worth of my measurements in there that I constantly do weird things with. Um, to try to understand more about my disease, and I haven't run into anything with that either. So a couple of different data types uh, and haven't had any problems. And the email one is just, it's wildly crazy what stuff I get back out of it. So, yes? About like merge, merge data, so what kind of function already exists in pandas? Like merge, merging data. 
Yes, so the, there is a merge function, and then I showed the join function. I prefer the join one because it joins on index every time. Merge will actually tack on uh, extra columns or extra rows, and when it decides to do which is based on whether or not you told it what index is in that other table. So I prefer the join because it's always explicit about putting them together. But that's two ways to take the data and put them together is uh, create, read two data frames. You can literally do data frame plus data frame, and that will attempt to merge. Uh, or you can do the dot join like I showed in an earlier example. Uh, let's see if I can get back to there. I can't read my own screen. I know I showed it. Anybody remember where? Resampling. So long ago. I'm really just trying to see how many times I can show you that one panda gif in, in one presentation <laughs> if you're not following. The internet is a beautiful place. <laughs> it's also scary. <laughs> yes. I'm not having any luck, but oh, there it is. It was the joining was in two big letters. Um, so there's an example of doing dot join. There's also a dot right join and a dot left join that works exactly like SQL. And again, there's dot merge, but you have to specify the index that you want to join on if it's a dot merge. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yes. Oh, sorry. Is there a link between like the pandas and the SQL? Like we can read it directly into data frame from like a, from a database. Like yes. So what I do in this case, most so of this repeat, data. Repeat oh, okay. So the question was, how can I get from Pan from SQL into pandas? Right. Uh, so what I do most of the time, and this is a shameless plug for SQL Alchemy, uh, but I use SQL Alchemy and have it give me the dot values version of the output. And so if I have a a uh, results proxy object in the Django world is what it's called, but you can take those and feed them directly into pandas. It understands them because essentially they're a, diction, a list of dictionaries. So anything that's a list of dictionaries is something I can read directly into pandas. So if I do my querying outside of pandas and then say pull it into the data frame, it can do that in one motion. I just say this is my data source for the data frame. Much like I said to, from CSV, I can do from dict and say again give it that list of dictionaries. Yes, I think you were next. Yeah, I just I was curious. It seems like you're, uh, it's a really good like playground for like manipulating your data, seeing what things go. But wouldn't a lot of the time you use like a SQL Alchemy query or just some kind of raw SQL to get it grouped by that? Like just based on the fact you're not keeping memory and then export it. I like I really like uh, Vincent by the way. That was really awesome. Yeah. But I was just curious if you use it more as a playground or if this is actually the code that goes in. Let's say if you're hosting a web app. Wouldn't it be better usually to? Okay. Get up a, oh, so right. here's the interesting thing. Yeah, so the question was, why do you do all this stuff in pandas when you could do grouping and unique SQL queries inside of SQL Alchemy? And I think part of that is, uh, for me, SQL Alchemy becomes, uh, is an extremely powerful tool, but it requires me to kind of know what my end destination is beforehand, right? Where with pandas, I can tell SQL Alchemy, go give me this block of data. My user is going to do random things to this, right? He's going to click columns to include, columns to exclude. He's going to want to time slice this. So time slicing in SQL is a pain, right? I did it in a super simple uh, slice. Uh, so that's the main reason why I use panda. It's all sugar on top of existing things, no doubt, right? You could literally do all of this with SQL Alchemy and NumPy. You also might be a scientist, and I would be completely bald rather than just the like eight sprigs I have Homer style. Yeah. But that that is why I do that. A good provider for like if you have a user interface that manipulates this stuff. Like, right. Like so my users, when they see this, not the cookies one, that's only me. Uh, but when the people see the reports that I pull out of that, they want to see the charts that come out of Vincent, and then they want to be able to profile like, okay, this time slice for this particular account for this thing. Well, I don't know what they want ahead of time, right? I'd have to take them to like a query screen. Uh, where they selected all those elements ahead of time. This actually lets, gives them a chance to see everything and then kind of manipulate it and play with it themselves in place without killing me, right? So I didn't show this because I was trying to stay away from JavaScript, obviously, but you, know, you can use WebSockets to push and pull data in and out of this data frame to get the view that they want based on checkbox. Super simple. So that's, that's my primary driver. Yes? Absolutely. As long as you're not trying to do like natural language analysis, or if you're trying to do natural language analysis and you're going to map across that, then it's fine for that. Oh, so the question was, I've been showing numeric data. What if it was non-numeric data? What if it was additional objects or dictionaries, list, or in his case, he's mentioned strings. 
So it's all about being able to use that map function to do what you want to do to that data. So if that works for you, it's fine. But if I was going to say, read 100,000 words and then produce a sentiment analysis of that, I would not do that through pandas. Right? I would do that in a different way. In the way, way back, back row. Yes, the, answer, the proper answer is to probably read the docs. But can you use relative times in your slices? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that time delta thing that we've been doing forever. So the question was, can you use relative times in your slices? And the answer to that is yes. You can do it two ways. If you like time delta that we use normally to do, like I want to go back a day, minus time delta, whatever, uh, you can do that. Or you can also say in, in the current version, like minus five minutes, like minus 5 a.m. And it'll just go back five minutes and then give you that chunk. So it's pretty neat. Yes? You kind of mentioned in passing IPython. I'm wondering if you use it in an IPython notebook, and if so, what kind of integration there is? Oh, do I have long enough to show this, and can I pull this out? Okay, so the question was, I want to do this in IPython because IPython is the greatest thing ever invented, and I don't understand why I don't do everything in it. If only I could get my end users to use IPython, my life would be awesome. Uh, that was, I think, your question? Okay. Um, so... By all means, uh, can we like not show this on video? That would be awesome. Um, <laughs> Carl, edit me. All right. So here I have this. Is not, is not here. It's coming. <laughs> I'm hiding specific secret sauce. All right. Um, so I am starting up an IPython notebook. Yeah, this is not the stuff you were looking for. Thank you for that joke. Give that guy some credit. Hey, look, IPython. So here is the data that we just looked at. Uh, pulled into an IPython notebook. So you were asking how does it integrate here? So I'm importing pandas just like I would. Setting the option to say don't give this to me in HTML because otherwise if I don't do this, this is also kind of cool I guess. Uh, if I don't do this, check out how, what happens when I just view a data frame. Ooh, that's a nicely formatted HTML table, isn't it? Uh, so this is exactly that. Now, Vincent is the thing that actually has some integration to it, right? So uh, it needs to know how to render, and thankfully those people at Vincent know that we hate JavaScript. Uh, and so they gave us this, hey, initialize notebook. And that makes the IPython notebook immediately understand what to do with Vincent data uh, and with Vincent charts. So here, let's just hit, go down to where we're actually doing something with Vincent. Come here. This is a big data set, can you tell? <laughs> we'll, we'll slice this time out of here. All right. So here's that same code that we would do before, and that would render me a chart in cell right as a result. Uh, I think if I... I won't be able to run this because I haven't run all the intermediate steps. But the code's the same. You just have to call that initialize notebook piece at the front. Other than that, Pandas already knows about IPython notebook. Scientists are awesome. Uh, and so when they put the two together, they play naturally together. The only thing you need to know special, again, is this little section here about Vincent, uh, just to get it to initialize the notebook. And I'll scroll that up so you can actually see it. You really have five. Wow, that's, that's some science math. He holds up 10, oh, tells sorry. me I have five. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? No? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes? So with Vincent, um, if you save the notebook and then run it through MD Viewer to have a static HTML page, do you know if that works well? So Vincent, so the question is, can I use a Notebook Viewer to create an output where I can still render the Vincent? Yes. So Vincent ultimately is using Vega, which is ultimately using D3, which is ultimately using JavaScript, which kills like 20 kiddians every time you use it. And so I can actually freeze a cell. Like, you know how you can embed an image? I can tell uh, Vincent, make me an image instead of this HTML thing, and it will leave an image in there, just like you would if you were putting any other image in place. Anything else? All right, thank you so much. Nobody get out. <laughs>